All right, let's go ahead and begin the prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your moving and acting in history. You're revealing truth to us so we can better understand who we are and where we've come from and where we are going. We ask you, Lord, that as we come here this evening to take from us any weariness of this day, to refresh us, to give us minds to understand where you're calling us and leading us deeper into an encounter with you, so we find that which satisfies the deepest desires and longings of our hearts. We ask all of this through Christ and in the words he gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, welcome back to this beginning class of biblical studies and how to do, interpret and read the scriptures and principles and foundations of biblical studies. Um, so this is the beginning of the year. This is obviously, this was supposed to be the second class, but because of the storm last week, we didn't have last week. So I'm going to try to combine that into the next three. So it might, might not be as uh, clean cut as it was supposed to, but I'll still try to cover the majority of the material that I was planning on. So today, we're going to, I would like to focus predominantly today upon the different tools to be aware of when you are reading the scriptures and the different things to be aware of specifically which is going to be foundational for understanding the correct interpretation. So this is more about tools. And I can probably pr pretty much guarantee that you've probably not uh, approached the scriptures from this perspective before. Even if you've taken uh, biblical studies classes in college or in any type of university. Because um, my approach is a little bit different as you probably have noticed from many things. <clears throat> because at the end of the day, I'm not really the best, and I was not ever really the best academic. And actually, I usually found a lot of academic studies to be rather dry. <laughs> okay, and, but biblical studies can appear on the surface levels to be dry, but they are one of the most fascinating ways in which we understand God speaking to us, especially through the scriptures. We understand that God's word, the scriptures, are the word of God. We call them the inspired word of God. And for the ancients... And a lot of this has to do with a lot of different reasons, but the ancients had a better understanding of literature for the most part than we do today. And many people forget that the Holy Scriptures is a body of written work, which is a body of literature. Okay, Now literature, which is true, but still, there are many different literary forms in the Bible. Now most people might be familiar with one or two of those literary forms, just as Many people here are probably familiar with the different forms. When you walk into a library, you know that there's different sections in the library, right? And so in that, you're going to find that the Bible being written at various times by various different people who were inspired by God wrote them with different understandings and under different literary forms. So form criticism is one actually form in which many biblical scholars use and my way of approaching form criticism is going to be a little bit different than maybe you've approached in the past because I'm going to look at it from a cultural level and really understanding how the cultural forms were present at the time that the scriptures were written. And the clearest, now a lot of times people try to use the actual kind of the, the, the critical way of going, going back to what the author understood and meant. If anyone has read the Second Vatican Council documents on Dei Verbum, Dei, which means God, Verbum, which means Word, Word of God. Dei Verbum, there was five main documents that came out of the Second Vatican Council. And one of the five documents was specifically on the interpretation of the scriptures. Okay. So the Vatican II was all about bringing the church and helping the church to address the concerns and needs of the modern day world. And in light of the Protestant Reformation, especially in light of the Gutenberg Press, and all the things that had happened with the Bible since the Protestant Reformation is that the interpretation of the scriptures had not changed in the Catholic Church, but there was a lot of confusion and chaos because now people had access to books versus in the past they did not. Okay, and especially with the Bible. And that caused a lot of chaos. The church never was against people reading the Bible. There sometimes is the perspective that like, the Catholic Church tried to not, didn't, wasn't very happy about people reading the Bible. And that's true and yet not true. There is some truth to that. Have you ever heard of the Protestant reformer Huss? Huss wanted to get Bibles into everyone's hands. 
Well, there's a problem with that, and the church was aware of the problem at that time, as we're still aware of it today. We just realize that now everyone has Bibles in their hands. Is that when you read the Bible, not everyone understands what they're reading. Okay, the Bible is a mature document. It is not a children's novel. It is also a document which is written in lots of different ways. Okay, just like a, a library has lots of different literary forms you find because you can go into the science fiction part of the library or the fantasy part of the library. You can go to the non-fiction part of the library. You can go to the reference part of the library. You can go to the historical part of the library. Right? And we know this because you go to the library. If anyone, well, I know that you guys have been to the library. I don't think some of our young people have ever been to a library. <coughs> Actually, I was at a school not too long ago, and they were getting rid of their library, and like shattered and broke my heart. <laughs> okay, because they decided to go completely online, and I was just like, "Oh my gosh, this is culture is dying." And I was like, oh. "I also, my mom dropped me off at the library every day, and that's where I did my homeschooling studies." And so, actually, I know libraries. That's where I was kind of did my own schooling and things like that. So, but libraries, if you know anything about libraries, you obviously know there's lots of different sections. Okay. The Bible is the same. And that's what people sometimes don't realize about the Bible. The Bible has lots of different literary sections. And not all of them are the same. The way in which you read science fiction in the library is going to be different than the way in which you read nonfiction. The way in which you read a reference book on some very boring book, and that's why no one really reads references unless they're writing their doctoral dissertation, right? And so. There are different ways in which the scriptures were written, and it's critically important when reading the Bible that you understand, first of all, what you're dealing with, what type of book you're dealing with. Because if you apply the same interpretation and the same tools of interpretation to every single form, you are going to misinterpret the particular form. Does this make sense? Okay. And so, using and not using the way that we understand, because the library system. Again, this is like an, an analogy, and it's not a perfect analogy, but it's it's a it's an easily understandable one. The library system and the cultural literary forms, as well as the literary forms at the time that the authors are writing, are different than what they are today. So, for instance, when you're reading history in the ancient times, the manner in which the ancient historians relate history is different than the way in which we relay history. So, for instance. Oftentimes in ancient times, ancient historians didn't really care about numbers. Well, they actually did care about numbers, but not the way we care about numbers. We are like micromanagers on numbers. We like every number to be exact. And if a journalist gets the numbers wrong, what? He can sometimes be fired today, right? For getting that wrong because it's inaccurate. The data was wrong and things like that. The ancients didn't care about that. They were not cared about the, the minutia. They were not concerned about the little details. They were concerned that you remembered the event and you remembered the reality of the event and the importance of the event. And so they would actually use numbers in a very different way. They would give you numbers which were sometimes extraordinary, but that the number meant something. Right? So they would sometimes use the number 20,000. Or that there was 200,000 men who died that day. There wasn't 200,000 men in the ancient, in that part of the world at that time. Okay? But for the ancients, that wasn't a, that's not a historical lie. Because that number means something. Okay? And the Jews were king, were the kind of the kings of numbers and using numbers to relay certain secret information and things like this. So they didn't just choose these numbers willy-nilly. And they're not just exaggerating. There's more to it. But that's the ancient way of handling history. Okay, which is very different than the ways than the types of ways in which we deal with history today. So when we talk about the inspired word of God, I would also say this: most no one who's writing the Bible, or very, I would say for the most part, I'm not sure that any of them knew that they were being inspired by God. Okay, God will inspire them inspire them to various things, but for the most part, they probably don't understand at the time. They're just writing something to because they think it's important. They're just writing it because they think that this wants, this is something important. And actually, many times what they're writing about is something that they themselves didn't experience, but it's their oral histories and their oral stories. Because long before the Bible ever arrived in its written form, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, everything was relayed through stories. Everything was relayed through what's referred to as oral tradition. And oral tradition, for the ancients, is something which is very clearly understood. 
because for the most part, when you were dealing with in the ancient world, they didn't have paper. Okay, they didn't have books. They now in Egypt they had papyrus, papyrus scrolls. It was extremely expensive, and they didn't have access to writing all. The only thing, most of the things that were written on ancient scrolls and these like that, a lot of them were banking records. <laughs> that was the most important thing. You get your numbers right, right. Banking records and things like this, movements, econ um, economics, and things like this. Most of the stories, now there's a few stories which we told. The ancient Egyptians, for the most part, used papyrus, and sometimes they would use hieroglyphics on the walls. That's where we can still see in the pyramids the stories and hieroglyphics and things like this. But if you know anything about hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics is not really a precise language, right? But it gets the basic message across. Ancient writings, cuneiform, written on little clay tablets which is what the, uh, I believe the Sumerian Empire used. Okay, these things are not very that explicit. But I'll tell you what was explicit was their oral verbal stories. Okay, the oral verbal stories, the oral verbal traditions, and the oral verbal ways in which people used to tell things. And actually, if you know anything about ancient history, you'll know that Homer, the figure of Homer who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer was before he wrote everything out. He's the first person to write down these stories, but they've been, in, they've been in circulation for a long time, and they're told by what's referred to as bards. Okay, bards. People who have been trained in keeping the living traditions alive, and keeping the stories alive, and keeping them, part of actually their job was to keep them alive and unchanged. Right? People didn't like you messing, and there was actually ways in which during the oral periods that people would keep the stories unchanged. We're going to talk about a little bit about that tonight. Okay, but it's important to recognize that some of the stories were epic stories. Some of the stories were um, moral stories. Some of the stories were hist histories. Okay, and now it's a lot harder to, and if you think about it, just practically speaking, it's a lot harder to remember the number 257 people died. All right. Much easier to remember 500 people died. Right? It makes it also for a better story. People remember that a little bit better than 237 people died. Okay? It also keeps in the memory alive a little bit more. So are these things inaccurate? By the ancient perspective, no, they're not accurate because they're not concerned with the minutia of details like that. And so long before the Bible is ever written down, okay, it like Homer, it's going to be relayed through oral stories and through oral, what's referred to as oral tradition. Which is interesting because sometimes people devalue the importance of tradition in the ancient world. Tradition preceded, tradition preceded written words. Okay? And that's something to be important. Something also from the Jewish perspective as well as obviously from our Catholic perspective. It's one of the reasons why as a Catholic people we are a people of faith and tradition. Because before things are ever written down, they are going to be in the tradition. They're going to be in the oral stories, in the oral forms, in the oral ways and passing on knowledge. Sons who are talking. So if, if you ever hear, if you've ever been to a Jewish Passover, is that what? They don't, for the most part, usually read it. Sometimes they'll read it. But actually, more often than not, it's a, it's a conversation which happens between the oldest male and the youngest male. Right? And it's a whole scene that they act out as they go through the Passover. You guys heard something at least about this? So, but at the time... The person who is writing down the scriptures thinks it's important. These things have been in circulation for a very long time. Okay, that's also be why they got the best people to write it down. These were called oftentimes scribes. Your scribe would write it down. It actually leads to that the scribes became a very important class of people during the time of Jesus because they're the ones for making sure that the story got right. Does this make sense? So when we say inspired, then the question becomes, what do we mean inspired? We mean that the people who were in those oral period were inspired by God. They kept the story alive, that God was using them, oftentimes despite their knowledge. And one of the ways in which actually you would determine how do we know between all these variations and stories, which ones were. Because the one which lasted is the one which is inspired. Because there were actually, and there are many variations of the stories found in Scripture. Did you guys know this? Like, there's many variations of the flood story. Now, there's the Christian. There's the one that we find in the Christian Bible. But there's the flood story is a very ancient story which precedes written civilization. We know this because it's often found, again, it was found in the New World. It was found in the, um, um, what's it called, Incan, Incan Empire. 
again, I believe it's the Incan, or most certainly the Native American Indians in the New World. It was found in Asia. It's been found in Africa. These very, very old stories, which precede, if you take the Noah story, regardless of whether or not, when you want to date, a pos give a possible date for when this story first developed, it is very, very old, and it most certainly precedes 2000 BC. Does this make sense? Because some of these civilizations also predates 2000 BC. So, are there variations in the story? Absolutely. That's why when we look as a Christian people at the variation that we have, we would say this is the authentic variation okay, versus the other ones because there's also going to be, again, you don't just have the Christians or at the ancient time, ancient Hebrews are the only people walking around with their stories. Many cultures had them. And one of the best ways in which you can understand this is that inspired, what does it mean to be inspired? Inspired means there's three qualities of being inspired. And when we say that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Okay, We don't mean that God sent his spirit down and all of a sudden God took control of that person's hand. Okay, And then started like writing out and that person's like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> That's not how God inspires people. Well, there are religious traditions which believe that. That's their understanding of inspired. That's why I'm making a point. Because it does distinguish us from other religions who basically say that God came down and basically took possession of that person and made sure and that, that type of inspired. That's not what we mean. We mean that God works very subtly through human beings, sometimes without them even, oftentimes without them being knowing what they're doing, to relay truth through them. Oftentimes truths that these people have talked about in terms of their families and relationships and things like this, and that God will use these things, and especially the times where he himself moves and acts directly, such as with Abraham, where God moves and acts directly with Abraham, and then Abraham never forgets this, passes it on to Abraham, to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob. But during that time, the Jews don't have a written, aren't, don't have a written stories. Like the Bible was not written during that time. So, all throughout this, you're going to find that inspired means to be have an extraordinary. So it's extraordinary, not ordinary. Okay, it is something which is extraordinary. It is something which is arising from an external, as opposed to internal. So this is not something that just comes from the human psyche or the human mind. This is something which in, comes from an outside source. So that it, it's also that's why we say it would be God as the source of inspiration, right? Because it doesn't come, it's not just a creation of our mind. But it is, actually, the third quality is that it's creative. And this would actually place it in juxtaposition. This is just right from the Webster's. This places it in juxtaposition that true inspiration is not destructive. Okay? Actually, in the ancient world, if you did something which was extraordinary, you did something that arose from some external muse, but it was destructive, bad things would happen. And this was not a good source of inspiration. It was a bad one. Such as, like, in the ancient Greek myth, there was one guy who decided that he wanted to see if Zeus was actually, and this is in the, Greek, in the Greek tradition, the Greek legends, if Zeus really was omnipotent. So he boiled his son and decided to feed his son to Zeus and to the other gods to see if they really knew what they were talking about. And then the gods wouldn't eat it, right? Why? Well, why was he condemned? Because in ancient Greece, the only way you could get to Mount Olympus, the only way in which you could find yourself rising into the heavens, deified, this notion of being deified, like Hercules, who becomes deified by Zeus, the only way in which you could become deified, the, only, the highest way for the religion that you could do it is that if you did something which was extraordinary that no one had ever done before, only if you were extraordinary could you catch the attention of the gods. Okay, Anyone who is ordinary... If you were just run of the mill, just bland, tasteless, if you just ran an ordinary life, you weren't going to catch the attention of anyone. You had to do something which was extraordinary. Okay? This is why an extraordinary, but also it had to be creative for true inspiration. Otherwise it would be condemned. So extraordinary, creative, and it's also something if you remember the story from like in the ancient Greek, and the reason I focus on the Greeks, and I'll be focusing on the Greeks, is that the Greeks are the best documented civilization that we have. But the Greeks were not unique. They didn't invent all these things. The Greeks came from the Mesopotamian cultures. They evolved out of all this different understanding. That's why if you understand the Greeks, you can understand a little bit about who the Hebrews were and their cultural mentality and their literary mentality. So what? The Greeks understood it had to be something which was external. It's what they called the muse. 
So the muse took hold of you and you became creative and that you did something which was extraordinary. That's why, why is Homer actually remembered? Not because he relayed the stories. Homer is remembered and kind of deified by the Greeks because he's the first person to write them down. Right? He did something which was extraordinary. He did something which was not normal. He did it. It actually was very helpful. It was a creative impulse. And that he was inspired by the muses. Does this make sense? So in the ancient times, the Hebrews also had the same understanding or a very similar understanding. And this is a little bit later than the Hebrews. The Hebrews are older than the Greeks. But this is the ancient understanding, especially in the Mesopotamian world, of inspiration. And it's for the most part still the understanding of inspiration that we have as Catholics today. We do not believe in like this, this kind of God come down and take over and likewise that this is what inspired is. God is using, a, he is an external force who is inspiring people in creative ways to do the extraordinary. Both in their personal lives as well as in the relating of scripture. Another thing about inspired, obviously inspired means to breathe. To breathe in. Right? Other, as opposed to expire. When you expire, and the last time you, you're expired. <laughs> okay, and you have expired. Okay, so to inspire is to breathe in. And this notion of breathing is actually very, very important in Scripture. Because when you breathe, breathe on me, breath of God, you have inspired in the word of God. You have inspired him. When God breathes into Adam, right, he breathes his spirit into Adam. The, Greek, the Hebrews understand that God literally breathed into Adam, but more importantly, oxygen is not the most important thing. The most important thing about God breathing into Adam is that Adam is now able to speak. He's able to reflect. He's able to ponder. He's able to be inspired. So he's inspired in literally the breath of God, but he's also inspired in the way that now he is able to do something that animals cannot do. He's able to be able to be inspired by God, and he's an inspired beating. So, when you look at the muse, the external force which inspires people in the ancient times, and this is the ancient Greek, actually, in Greece, which was very common in that time, it was basically all the gods in the ancient world were the personification of some type of force, or some type of entity, or some type of personification of something. All right? The more bigger the bigger the personification or more conceptual, more foundational it is, actually it's going to be kind of the more ancient. As you get to kind of more attributes getting down, you're going to find it. Because if originally in the Greek myths, which is also based loosely upon both the Egyptian and the Assyrian, again, the Babylonian, things like this, which you kind of see this, this weird hodgepodge between them. You can see how there's definitely a development in culture and mythology from where the, where the Greeks get where they are. We'll get to that next week when we talk about Saturn and who Saturn is. Um, but when you look at this, in ancient Greece, you have Gaia, right? Gaia spawns off these things. The first things that Gaia creates, Gaia, which is not just Earth. That's what sometimes people misunderstand about Gaia. Gaia, that people think Gaia is Earth. What Gaia really understands from the ancient perspective, Gaia is more of matter, material reality, physical reality, right? Gaia is the personification of physical reality. All right. So Gaia spawns the first ones. Does anyone remember from ancient Greek or if you had uh, read mythology by uh, Edith Hamilton, the first thing that Gaia spawns in the ancient Greek myths? Anyone? Monsters. <laughs> first thing that is spawned is the monsters. And, she's so, and Gaia is so horrified that actually they're chained in Tartarus and cast out of creation, things like this, the monsters, and the things that she actually spawns out next will be the titans. Okay, the titans will fight the monsters, will will defeat the monsters, and the titans. One of the most famous of the titans is obviously the one Kronos. Kronos, also who we'll be talking about next week, is Saturn, right? Kronos, who ate his children. Okay, Saturn did the same thing. So Kronos, but you know where that word is. It sounds a lot like chronological. Because Kronos is the personification of time. Right? But there was other titans. Atlas is one titan, the one who keeps everything on his back and shoulders, keeps the world spinning. Right? 
Then you also have uh, uh, Prometheus, I believe was, I think Prometheus was the Titan, if I remember correctly, gave fire, getting the importance of the element of fire, personification of fire. But then you'll have that there was one called Nimsin, who was the personification of, does anyone know? Nimsin. Or Nimsin, I believe that's how you pronounce. Personification of memory. Something which is very important in the ancient time, memory. Nemsin. Nemsin has relations with later on the third spawn, which is Zeus. And Zeus, who is kind of the god of the heavens, the god of the lightning bolt, the god of electricity, and things like this, will she'll spawn and nine different children. Okay, these nine different children. Now, I'm not saying that this is truth, I'm just telling you this is the Greek mythology. But this is the conceptual understanding of how people understand. But these things are not, this is not just a bunch of fairy tales. These things are actually very critical understandings of how people understood and formulated order in reality. Because memory, and we know this actually, the muse, the mother of all the muses is Nemsin, who is the personification of memory. And oftentimes that's why a muse will always have a feminine connotation to it, which is also found in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. You'll notice that wisdom will always be called, what, she? She. she. Okay. In the ancient times, because again, a woman, the personification, who is the source of inspiration for the creative artist, is what a muse means. And Nimsin will have nine different children, right? The nine muses. If you saw Hercules, there was only five, but in reality, in the ancient world, there was nine. The nine inch muses, these are right here. And these are what actually people would say was what you would be inspired by. One of the muses would take hold of you, right? and would enable you to do creative and extraordinary things. And so when one of them, the first one was epic poetry, Calope, epic poetry, which is an example of this, would be like the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, things of this nature, is one of the forms. But you read, and when you read epic poetry, it reads, what would be modern day? We still have this form today, sort of. Be said things like Lord of the Rings. And that's also why people are inspired by these things. And there's heavily dense material contained within them, just as there's heavily dense in the epics. Epic poetry, but then you have Cleo, history. Cleo is very different than epic poetry. It's a different form, different muse. And it's not the same thing. Now, you can sometimes have historical events. Sometimes historical events will also be told through epic poetry. One example of this would be like the Iliad. The Iliad, we know that there was a Troy. And they found it. They thought for a long time that actually Troy was just kind of a, a fantasy. It was just like this. And then they actually found it. Archaeologists found it in Turkey and were stunned because they had always thought that this was just some story that the Greeks had told. Okay. So with that, you'll also find the third one, Euterpe, music, was a inspirational muse. What's interesting about all of the muses, and science has actually since proved them, all of the muses are actually modern day mnemonic devices. It's actually true. Every single one of them actually helps facilitate your memory. Okay? Because if you can remember things in terms of a, like a fantastical story, it's actually easier to remember. Once you've seen Lord of the Rings, you usually, unless you were bored with it, where you saw the Harry Potter or whatever the things are, you saw these grand epics, what? You were inspired by them. That's why people go and watch the movies and things like this to this day. And you can talk to little kids, and they can tell you everything that happened in the story. They can't tell you what 2 plus 2 is. <laughs> Right? But they can tell you what happened in that story, and they can tell you almost line for line what happened in these types of things. Again, how many times have, have you heard a person who just knows every single line to uh, Monty Python in the quest for the Holy Grail? Right? And they can go back over and over and over again. Right? It's a mnemonic device. History. People who are, now some people hate history because it's about dates, but some people love history because it's more about events. And if you can remember history in terms of events and how this event spawned this one and this one hit this one, that's what caused this. That all of a sudden, when you have World War I spawned because you had nationalism which arose, and then you had the ancient empire of Aust Austria, the ancient Holy Roman Empire, Archduke Ferdinand. People were upset. There was Greek Orthodox who were upset. They killed Archduke Ferdinand and spawned all the things that went into the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, which spawned out the nationalism, all the things that happened for Versailles as a result of World War I, spawned out World War II, World War II, and World War II. You can remember things if you remember this boom, 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 boom in history. Mnemonic device, way in which you can recall memory. Euterpe, it has been proven, again, 
that music, you always remember music. It's actually why there's even music therapy. Oftentimes in a music therapy, even today, people will use music to try to, what, recall people's minds and like they can't bring a person peace, but then they play their favorite song that they heard as a little girl or a little boy, and all of a sudden it puts them into a perfect state of peace. Because we remember music, and they might even start humming something they haven't heard in 30 years. Okay? Mnemonic device. You look past that, you'll find errato, which is regular poetry. Okay, lyrical poetry. You'll find meloponini, which is where we get the world melodramatic. Who's had, who has things that have happened in their life which were really sad that you would do anything to forget? <laughs> and yet you can't. Meloponini is tragedy. Okay, meloponini, the melodramatic, things which are of a tragic nature, we can't, you can try to repress it, but you will always remember it. Right? And this is not only a form of literature, this is true in terms of events in human beings' lives. Tragedy is impossible to forget because it affects us, it changes us, it forms us. And this was one of the muses, tragedy. You'll find Tepshore dance, that the ancients would oftentimes would have dances. How many dances do you probably remember that you learned in second grade? You haven't danced in like 50, 60 years, some of you, or maybe 10 years for some of your other ones. But what? That those dances, though, you never forget them. Again, it's uncomfortable at first, but within about four or five seconds, you got that dance back down. And the ancients loved to dance. Actually, much of their religious significance was done in the context of dance. And this is still true, oftentimes, in many tribal societies. You can still see this in Africa. Parts of Africa, which actually dance is a pivotal part of their religious and cultural identity. They don't do anything without a dance. They're always dancing. It's one of the reasons why when David's coming in to Jerusalem, David, who is a poet, right? And then what happens? The spirit inspires him. The spirit comes down and lands upon him, and he starts to dance with abandon, okay? Even to the point where he doesn't notice that his clothes are falling off, okay? Urania, astronomy, and astronomy, but it's not really astronomy because astronomy is a science, a science that we understand astronomy today, when they said astronomy in the old times, this was, and it was not really astrology, although their astrology would come out of this. Astrology is the trying to use the, um, to divinize the future, magic and things like this, which can be kind of a branch out of Urania. But this is more of astrologic, okay? Looking at the universe to answer and try to answer the big meanings, the big questions in life, okay? Looking at the universe because the stars don't change. And see, if you can look at the stars, especially sailors, you associate a, this star with a story, like Orion, the hunter. You can not only know where you're going, okay, but also you can remember these stories which make this, the, story, the traveling a little bit more pleasant. Not only that, but these stories oftentimes in this are oftentimes going to be extravagant. Again, planetary travel. Again, people, we, people have always been thinking about planetary travel. It's not just now that we have science, things like that. People have always been thinking about what's beyond? What's out there? Okay, where do we come from? Who are we? And can we find the thing which seems to be missing right now? Can I find it out there? All right, this is Urania. This is the ancient Greeks understood this. This is where you be inspired and things like this. The stars, which were unmoving and yet constantly seem to be moving, right? So also, polyhymna, hymns, and the third, and the last one, thalia, comedy, okay? That not only can you remember things that are really sad, but if there's things that are really funny, you don't forget those things either. Funny stories. How many people know really funny jokes? Sometimes of an inappropriate nature, okay? But you never forget them because they're so funny, right? Or different stories which are funny. There's also one where we like comedy, Okay, and good comedy, good f things which are funny, you don't forget. All of these things, which are Greek, you will find an equivalent in the ancient Hebrews. This is the he ancient Hebrews. Again, this comes out of the ancient Mesopotamian world. This is the culture which they understand. All of these different forms you will find in scripture. And sometimes you're not just dealing with one, sometimes you might be dealing with two or three or four. And so it's important when looking at the scriptures to realize, because if you read a piece of Cleo, if you read a piece of history, and you try to interpret that history, and you try to interpret that and understand what you're reading, and you're using the same way in which you understand Urania, you're going to get seriously messed up in your interpretation. Why? Very different. 
Or if you try to interpret polyhymna or lyrical poetry, I believe it was Oscar Wilde who said, all good poetry stem, all bad poetry stems from authentic feeling. Okay? Why? Because poetry, for the most part, is not trying to express truth, logical truth. It's trying to express what's going on within me. Right? It's trying to express the feelings of our heart, the things like that. For the most part, it's also, most poetry is not seeking st static truth. It's just trying seeking self-expression. All right? And David, for the most part, very often, he's a poet who will write poetry, which will at times be turned into hymns, which is called the book of Psalms. Again, but in order to understand that, you have to realize, you, we're not oftentimes looking for truth in the Psalms, not at least logical truth. We're trying to understand the expressions and the movements and the feelings of the heart, what things that are going on. And if you try to interpret the book of Psalms in kind of a literal Cleo way, or in a moral way, you might get yourself very mi mixed up. That's where some people who look at the scriptures and try to just apply one type of interpretation. It's the way that I read it. That's how you interpret it. Because the God speaks literally. No, God speaks to us literally, but he also speaks to us subtly. And there are many subtle nuances in the scripture. Because all of these, I can tell you, all of these things and sometimes more will be found in scripture. And so that's why it's important to recognize what type of book, what type of thing are you dealing with. Does this make sense? Because it's also why many people get mixed, mixed, up, mixed up. Because sometimes they don't realize that they're actually reading this. Euterpe. <laughs> music. You know that there's music in the scriptures? Or polyhymna, mm -hmm. which are hymns. Like, some of the scriptures were never meant to be really be read. They were meant to be sung. And that's actually how they were written and designed. And they really sound really weird. They sound really awkward. If you just read them and they're just like, you're just like, what does this mean? Well, sometimes what you're reading is an ancient hymn. Or you're reading an ancient song. Okay? And therefore, if you try to understand it, you have to understand it in terms of that. Because now, if you know also anything about music, as well as poetry and things like this, which is how oftentimes the stories would be relayed, was through music, through stories, through lyrical poetry or epic poetry and things like this. You'll know that there's, in all poetry, and I'm not a poet, but I just know this about it, there's what? There's meter, there's rhythm. Because some people are like, well, if during that oral period, then the message must have been lost. Like if God initially spoke to Abraham, then you have this long history of people who are talking. They ever, like the telephone game? The telephone game, this person said, dog, this person said log, this person said frog, this person said Frank, and so somehow, what, dog turned into Frank, <laughs> okay? But see, that only applies if we're speaking like this. You can't change words which are associated with meter and rhythm and things like this. It keeps the message and it keeps the content static. It's also one of the reasons why the ancient barge could remember things, because it was told through the lens of things which kept it. And as soon as a person, if you went off key, right, everyone knows when a person goes off key, <laughs> or when they don't follow the meter, when they don't follow the things like that, this is how the ancients kept the message intact. Does it make sense? This is why the stories, for the most part, might have small deviations here and there when a person like adapts it or, or works something new and funny in, which happens. But for the most part, the ancient stories are not going to change all that much because if they had just been stories like the way that we oftentimes tell stories, but we don't need to remember stories because we have this wonderful creation called books, which no one reads. Okay? So, within this, to muse, not only is one of these ancient things, but the other connotation of muse means to be absorbed into thought. An intense period of reflection if it's used as a noun. Why do I say this? Because to muse also means this. So when you muse, when you are musing, is that you're also musing, the ancient understanding is you're musing with the gods, or in the Hebrew perception, God. Because the Hebrews are very unique in the ancient world, is that they, unlike all the pagans around them, who oftentimes give a personification to different attributes and associate this with the gods, the Hebrews are pretty much the only persons who say, no, God is the personification of all all attributes, right? So Zeus is only one or two things. Hera, homemaker, Zeus, god of the lightning bolt and things like this. 
Hephaestus, who's the god of the mountains and of, of workers and things like this, but that's really all that they do. They have one thing. The Hebrews were unique, and this is why they are not polytheists, but monotheists, is that they attribute to God all of the attributes, all of the things that inspire them. And they say that God is one. Okay? So in this, they believe that the spirit of God, which rests upon them, they're not being inspired by all these different deities, they're being inspired by the one true God. And oftentimes they won't realize this until after the fact. So also in association with this, when we talk about inspired, we also as Catholics mean a similar thing to this today. This is a little bit more complex than someone just grabbing your hand and writing it down. It means that God works in a much more fluid way, a subtle way, which is oftentimes harder to discern, the movements of the Spirit. And actually, the movements of the Spirit were always very difficult to discern, especially in the ancient world. Many people don't realize that, you know, actually, for the most part, how the ancient high priest of Israel would discern God's will? Does anyone know how? With dice. <laughs> With dice. Yeah. Because he didn't speak. He didn't speak. God did not speak, for the most part, directly to man. That's why Moses is so, like, it's so extraordinary with Moses. Because that's not normally how God speaks. When God speaks to Moses directly, and then Moses comes down. That's also why the people look at Moses initially, and they're like, you crazy. That's not how God does. And so when, like, God is saying, I spoke to God in a burning bush, they're like, sure you were. <laughs> Okay, or when he says, that, but then all of a sudden, then they see the they see the extraordinary events. And they're like, oh, this man actually, there's something extraordinary about this man. Extraordinary, right? The books of Moses, which will come out again, the Torah and things of that nature. So in that, when you look at this, the main theme of Scripture is ultimately answering the question: Is what makes man man? Okay, I like this of the modern evolution of man. <laughs> have you ever seen Europe? Have you ever seen Asia? Japan is <laughs> evolving into robots. Okay. <laughs> Other mythology. But with, anyways, the real question in scripture is what makes man, man? This is what in philosophy is called, uh, what's my time? Just where? 5.30. Five thirty. thank you. What makes man, man? This is what in philosophy is called uh, philosophical anthropology. So the philosophy of humanity. And what many people don't realize is that the language of the Hebrews, okay, Hebrew itself, is a very simple language. It's not actually a very complex language. It's a little bit weird because it's written this way as opposed to this way. The alphabet is slightly different. And even when writing things, they don't write vowels for the most part in their, la in their words. They write consonants. And then the person who's reading it knows it. It also means that there sometimes is mistranslations, or they also actually sometimes will play play with those things, and they'll use one word, but they'll sometimes be referencing another one in a subtle way. And so you, they kind of leave you a little bit confused at times about what they actually mean. The Hebrew is famous for making plays on words and puns. Okay? And so in this sense, the Hebrews love their language because it actually is not like English. <laughs> English, which is very usually much more one of the most precise languages because it comes from German. It originates in kind of a hodgepodge between German and Latin. Okay, and so German, because we have that German background, which German is also a very precise language with precision. Okay, but Hebrew is not. Hebrew is very vague. And you can actually do a lot of very kind of creative things with Hebrew that you wouldn't be able to do as well with English. Okay. So they will actually, the Hebrews would do things with language, which for the most part, unless you are really, and you refine just really certain authors who really do it, we really don't see all that much today. And actually, we really can't do it because language is different. But in that, they will use nuance, they will use subterfuge, they will use all these different literary ways of actually talking about sometimes one or two or three or four or five things at the same time. Which is why sometimes the scriptures can be confusing. They'll sometimes play on different forms at the same time. And it's not always clear what you're reading. Sometimes you might think that you're getting a moral passage. Like, for instance, today's reading, if you came to Mass with me earlier today, you'll notice that I preached on Lamech. Right? Lamech, who was the great-grandson of Cain. And then you have like this little weird passage, which was actually a hymn, or was an ancient kind of poem, that they kept alive of what he says to his wives when he takes two wives. He's the first polygamist. 
Okay, and then he has this little phrase. And then you read the phrase where he's boasting about basically taking advantage of God. That he's not going, there's not going to be any consequence to his actions. He said, Cain, there's nothing happened to Cain, and anyone who attacked Cain would have been punished by seven times. I am his great-grandson. He, after I've killed this man who's insulted me, he said, 70 times 7 is, is how much will come down upon them. Basically saying, I will never have to face the consequences of my actions. Right? Because God doesn't, God doesn't act. But you just read that. If you don't understand the, the, the context behind it, you can come out and think that, at, that, is this a good thing? That's where it pretty much it stops. It doesn't say, doesn't say the Lamech was punished. doesn't say anything about that. All it says is that that's, that's pretty much the end. And you're just like, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, the Hebrews had an understanding of what this meant. They were giving you an understanding of one, associating arrogance, violence, with polygamy. Does that make sense? Okay. And if you read Psalm 73, you know what happens to arrogant people. You know what happens to evil people who disregard the law of God. But it's interesting, at this point, Lamech, there's no law of God because there's no law of Moses. And yet he's what? He is going to be condemned. And from a Hebrew perspective, because even though he doesn't know it, he's, again, in ignorance of the law. He still breaks the law and things like this. And so contained within that, you're going to start finding subtle, very subtle hints of what the Jews understand reality to be. Even ignorance of the law. But he also what? He knew that Cain, but he will misinterpret Cain's words. He will take the thing which was given to Cain, and he will take the curse of Cain, which again was given to him, and which ultimately there was a mercy which was associated with that, and he will turn the mercy into this kind of this aura of invincibility that he can't be touched. Right? The supreme arrogance in the story. But if you just read that story, you can miss, I mean, if you just read it, you just think, I don't even know what this is talking about. That's why it takes a little bit of nuance. It takes a little bit of understanding the culture as well as the language and things like this. When you look at even the word Adam, and this is where the people, people don't understand, the ancients were very philosophical. Okay? The ancient Hebrews especially were very philosophical. And the one thing about the Hebrew God more than anything else, Hebrew God, which you can obviously start with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, before that Noah, and before that Adam, but the Hebrew God, for the most part, is very unique. Because one, he's one. Okay? He's got a mercy and justice, which seems to be in contradiction almost at times. But they're going to be wondering throughout the entirety of their history, who are we? And so the Hebrews will build, even from the very first story that they tell, which is Genesis. Which again, at the time in their history, this wasn't the first story. This was just one of the stories. Because right? they didn't have the timeline that we had today. And that's actually important to recognize the timeline that they had. That whoever the biblical author of, was of the Torah, again, put these stories into a timeline. But still, the timeline from the ancient perspective, these are just st collections of stories, which will show a progression of things that are happening. But the first thing, and why I say that it's a very philosophical, is that the word Adam, most people don't even realize what the word Adam means. And I'll give you an example of kind of using some of the formula we're talking about. Adam, most likely, again, I am a per firm believer that we do come from two common ancestors. Genetics can prove that we have one common ancestor, a female. Okay? But in that notion that we come from two common ancestors, they probably, I'll tell you this, I'm not, I don't think that Eve, the first female, called Adam, Adam. Okay? And I don't think that Adam called the first female Eve could have. But I also know what Adam means. And I know why the ancient Hebrews and the ancient world used the name Adam. Because Adam is a composition between two Jewish words. The first part of his word is ah. The second part is dumb. This is why you say even the word Adam is a philosophical anthropology. A philosophy of the human person. Did you guys realize this? Because in the philosophy of the human person, he is dumb. Okay? He is what? Like all animals, he is an animal. Dom, D-M, means flesh, blood, earthy, red. It actually means fleshy. Material. But when they say fleshy, what do they also mean? They don't just mean like hunk of flesh. They mean material. That's, but they didn't have the word, they didn't have matter and form. That came later on from the Greeks. They would have said flesh. He's a fleshy being. And all fleshy beings 
have in their posture, the ancient, Greece, the ancient Hebrews understood, any animal which looked down. The eyes are the windows of the soul. Any animal that looked down would find their desires and would find their heart's desires satisfied in the things that it looked upon. So all animals who, for the most part, the ancient, I'm just saying that obviously there's different animals who we know from science look up, but that's something that the ancient Hebrews understood. They understood all animals look down. That's why they're in kind of this, this type of position. Because their eyes are looking to where they will find their heart's desire. And that's what all things do. That's why they will find their desires by looking down. Adam, perhaps half of his name, is dumb. So therefore, he is an animal. He will find the satisfaction of his heart's desire by looking down, by looking into the earth. And this is not a bad thing. This is how God created him because God gave him the name Adam. Right? It wasn't Eve who gave it. God gave him Adam. This is the way I created you. And this is the complexity of the Hebrew mind is that they understood that we are material beings. They are not Gnostics. They are not people who believe that matter was evil. Which is actually was a very popular belief in that time. Material reality is the source of all pain and suffering. The real, the real things that bring us joy is spirit. Spiritual reality. Because that's immortal and that's where we can find it. No, the, the Hebrews had this beautiful understanding that material reality was a good thing. It's actually the first thing that God teaches. God created the heavens and the earth. They were good. God created the sky. It was good. He created the plant life. It was good. He created, what, all the animals. They were good. Their notion of actually reality, of matter itself, is that it's good. So actually the fact that Adam also has a desire for the things of the earth, and that he will find his heart's desire, his heart's satisfaction, by looking down, is a good thing. But his name is not just dumb. His name is Adam. Because the first word, again, dumb, also means blood. So sometimes you'll hear, uh, some people will say that Adam means like dirt. That's not really what it means. It does mean dirt. So that's one of the things. But it means blood, dirt, fleshy, things like this. What it really means at the end of the day is the fleshiness that he will find his heart's desire by looking down because his eyes, he is an animal. But unlike the animals, he also has the ah. Aleph, which is the first word, I believe the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And therefore, the things of Aleph look up. Adam is the one being which can actually look up into the heavens. And because he can look up into the heavens, he also will find his heart's desire in looking up. And actually, he is, finds himself at a critical crossroads as being this weird creature which is created that will find satisfaction in his heart's desire in both and, not either or. The either or was a dualistic understanding of reality, which is not really what the ancient Hebrews understood in that ancient literature. So that's why people, when they say that the ancient Hebrews were um, dualists, that's really not, even from the Genesis story, that's not present in the Genesis story, this dualism. You'll find that what? The primacy of the good. The primacy of all good things. So in this, he will find his heart's desire because if you know what the word aleph means, in Hebrew it means to elucidate. That's what it means, to elucidate. And to elucidate is to speak. Adam is the one animal that has the ability to speak. He has the ability for specifically for words. He has words that can come out of his mouth. And he's not just like a parrot who can, who can mimic words. He's actually someone who can elucidate, which means to think, to have cognizance, to be able to be inspired, the ability to muse, all these different connotations of the word aleph. So in this, you'll find that the human anthropology, which is found just in that very simple word, is very complex. Does this make sense? And so this is just one example of that where you're going to find that the Hebrews would do very fascinating things with language relaying perfect truths. But that's also they also did it in a way which was very subtle that you had to take years of study to understand. It was also something which they didn't want pretty much just anyone to know what it was that they believed. They also believed themselves to be a people set apart. They intentionally made their scriptures difficult to understand. So that if someone looked up if someone who is not a Jew looked at this and they just saw this is just looked like a bunch of hogwash, or this just looks like a bunch of weird stuff, or this just looks like a bunch of fairy tales, and they throw it to the side. 
And then the Jews would come up behind and pick up the word of God. Right? They would also tell their stories. What? They told their stories to their children. That's one of the reasons. Again, where did they tell it to other people? We really don't know for certain. But what? As they were captured by the Babylonians, and this is one of the Psalms, they said to the Babylonians, said, sing to us one of Zion's songs. And then the response that the Jews have is, how could we sing the song of the Lord on foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Right? We're not going to give you our songs. We are going to keep them to ourselves because you're not worthy of them. You are pigs. You are dogs. You are unclean barbarians. You are not the chosen people. You'll find actually exempt, exempt, you'll find different elements, different prophets you will speak. Maybe one day you'll be. That's what Isaiah will say. God's going to call all nations through Israel back to himself. But for the most part, the Jews did not just want anyone to understand what it was they were talking about. It's also why they made things intentionally unclear at times. So, when you look at the Bible as being the scriptures, the word of God, the inspired word of God, and where did it come from? It came from God using human beings who lived in a culture and who worked through them in their culture to relay his truths. Which is also why it's very important to understand the culture of the time as well as the forms and the ways in which they understood. This is why you can get, this is why we teach Bible stories to first and second graders because they can understand the basic stories. But this is also why you can get a doctoral degree in scripture. And there's a lot more complexity, I'll tell you this, there's a lot more depth and complexity to the scriptures than pretty much all the other world religion books. Now, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit biased in that, <laughs> obviously. But I can just say this, I mean, it's also the oldest document, one of the oldest cohesive documents that we've had. There was probably three moments where they were written down for the first time. Okay, when the oral period moved. And the classical understanding, or the, what most scripture scholars will agree to, now some people will say, well, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. There's a problem with that. Moses talks about his death. <laughs> and where he's buried, and no one knows where he's buried, and things like that. And you can't write posthumously. Okay? So, even if Moses wrote part of the Torah, which most biblical scholars don't think he did, is that what? That Moses' teachings was kept alive through the verbal stories and verbal things like this, through the people. Okay? And that God has the power and had the power and has the power and used his power to keep his message intact during that time. But it's also not unreasonable or irrational to believe that the story remained intact just by use of these mnemonic, of the mnemonic devices that we just talked about. Does that make sense? It's also why it's important to understand those mnemonic devices, but also, where did it come from? It came from people. It came from God who was inspiring people. So it's also important to understand people. And as you know, if you understand anything about people, you'll know that human beings are rather complex. Sometimes we speak metaphorically one to one to another. Sometimes we speak analogically to one another. Sometimes I speak literally and I mean exactly what I say, right? But in all these different ways, as people communicate, sometimes I speak poetically. That's why it's important to understand the context. Take something out of context and you will destroy or pervert the meaning. I mean, just take, and I'll tell you one of the most famous persons today who's always taken out of context, poor Pope Francis. <laughs> Poor, I love Francis, but when any time that I hear someone talk about Pope Francis said this or that or that, I'm just like, I don't believe you. And they're like, no, he said it. I was like, I believe that he said what you said, but let me go and look at the full context. And actually, I've never come into a part where I've actually had a disagreement with Francis, because in the context of what he's saying, like some people are like, he's saying that the Catholic Church is changing its teachings on contraception and abortion and things like this. And I was like, he didn't say that. And they're like, you don't know what he said. He could have said that. And I'm like, he didn't say that. <laughs> and they're like, I was like, how do you know? I was like, I'll go look it up. And I found out what it was. And what he said, he said, Catholics are called to be responsible and not breed like rabbits. Okay. He does speak off the cuff a lot. <laughs> okay. But what is, does that mean that he's opening up? No. You take his words, and he's also speaking to a particular group of people who had their own interests and their own things. And it was like side to question. This happens all the time. That's just one example. Uh, all the stuff on the environment. If anyone's heard, like everyone's been like moaning and complaining about him talking about the environment, how he's talking about global warming and that this is unclear and uncertain and things like that. What he said in the document was 
we don't know what the human cause of global warming is with certainty. He says, if human beings are having an impact, then we have a responsibility to take care of it. If we are not, we have the ability and the dominance, the dominion given to us by God to make a positive impact. And therefore, we can't be slothful and neglectful. And everyone took that out of context and simplified it and recreated his words to mean that Pope Francis is saying something which he did not say. Does that make sense? Yeah. And people do that to the scriptures more than they do it to Pope Francis. Okay? They take the scriptures out of context or they read it on a very literal level. And there is a literal meaning to the scriptures, but the literal meaning is not that you read it and you literally understand what you're reading. The scriptures and the Hebrew understanding of them is that they always had to be interpreted, they always were interpreted by valid interpreters. These are what was called in the Old Testament, as well as in Hebrew history, the priest, the prophet, and the king. Does that make sense? Because the prophet was the one who had listened to God and spoke on his behalf. The priest was the intermediary between God and man who sacrificed and reconnected people to God. And the king was the one who was given the authority to make judgments and discern what the will of God was in particular cases, like Solomon, who determines who the mother is. How does he know? Because he's inspired by God to do something which is terrifying. Cut the child in half. Why? Because he understands women's hearts. He knows that the real mother is going to flip out, but she does. And he says, the woman who just flipped out, that's the mother. Give the child to her. Okay? Because he's inspired. So in this, where does it come to? How does it get to us? It comes to us through human history. That's also why we call this the history of salvation. What's my time? You can go four more, four more minutes. All right, so the before the written word was the spoken word. God will speak to human persons, bestowing his authority on them to pass his message on without error. And for the most part, this is going to happen around campfires. We just lost power like last week, remember? And what I realized at that time, I was like, you know what? It's dark, and it's 7 o'clock, and I don't have power. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> okay, why? Because people went to bed. The only time you stayed up is if you're going to stay around a camp store, campfire and tell stories. Other than that, now, and I also understand now why people rose and had 6.45 a.m. mass. Because they'd gone to bed at 8 o'clock. <laughs> okay? Or things like that. Again, earlier rising, your earlier rising and going later to bed is of no use if you don't have a good heart. But no, what? So what? That was when they told their story. That's the only time because they worked the day and in the evening, that's when they would have time. And this is where this all happened. During this oral period, God's spirit is alive and rests upon people. And that's where some people focus just on the written word. Before the written word was the written word, it was the oral word because the oral word is actually to a certain extent superior to the written word. Do you know why? Because a living being is giving it. Versus the written word is a static piece of paper. You have a being. That's actually, what, is, what does it say in John's Gospel? The word was with God, the word was God, and the word was spoken. Right? That's why Jesus, that's why we call Jesus the word made flesh. That's what John, referencing John. The word, the spoken word of the Father. That God who speaks the word to us. And this notion of spoken words, of words, communication, elucidation, things like this is so important from the Jewish mindset. And that's why the Spirit is found in the living word and found, and was actually before it was ever found in a book, it was found in people. The problem is it became also, obviously, many different people said, I'm the, the real one who is speaking on behalf of God. And these were called false prophets. And that's actually a very common theme in that time. That's why false prophets are so important, because they don't have a book. They have prophets, right? They don't have a book. They have prophets. Therefore, how do you determine which one is actually speaking on behalf of God? Do you know how they determined who was speaking on behalf of God? Whoever's prophecies came true. Which means that actually prophecy was not about usually interpreting the future, because you couldn't actually, it was, no, it was almost, prophecy was almost not useful. There's nothing practically useful in terms of like divinizing the future. It's also why divinizers were condemned and thrown out of Israel. Prophecy was about understanding the movements of God in the past. Not about divinizing what was going to happen in the future. That's why, because what? There's lots of prophets at the time of Jeremiah. And no one believes that Jeremiah is the prophet. I'm not, I'm sorry, not Jeremiah. Jer people believe that. They just didn't like Jeremiah. Uh, at the time of, uh, who was it? 
Micah, or you'll find Micah, you'll find various ones like that who will basically say, you're a hillbilly, you're not really even a real prophet. Why? Because the ones who told the stories, as well as the ones who spoke on behalf of God. These were the words where you would find the scriptures were alive in the people. So during this period before, again, only initially transmitted, initially transmitted orally and written down by later or subsequent hearers, and they will be at times adapted and edited. So again, to give more clarity. Again, that people will take, scribes will do it to fix up sometimes or to answer questions. And this is actually even true in the New Testament. The Gospel of Mark, you will find additions or addendums. Right? Sometimes you'll find them in brackets so as that people could understand with greater clarity what's actually being spoken of here. You'll find these things throughout the entirety of the scripture. God will protect his message and doubting his authority so that this problem doesn't become a problem. <laughs> okay? The telephone game. So that God's, and we can trust the word. We can trust the word, and we can trust God even, see, I think that the problem with, especially the word and people who have this problem in the scriptures, is the main problem is not that they don't want to trust God, but they don't want to trust people. <laughs> Right? Because in order to trust the scriptures, you must trust that God can act through people. And some people, I think fundamentally, do not want to say that. They'll say that God can act through me, but I don't want to trust anyone else. Right? Because this does take a reliance that, yes, does God and will God act move through people? And this is one thing which you actually have to come to accounting with because this is very clear that the scriptures went through this oral period. So if you think that mankind by touching something is going to absolutely corrupt it, you're going to have a problem. But if God can persevere his word through that, then it's not a problem. And God can act and move through both civilization, he can act and move through culture, he can act through individual people's lives to avoid the message from becoming diluted because God is holding all of these things in his hands. So from the Catholic perspective, this oral period, as well as the problems that are presented, the supposed problems that are presented, and people say, well, no, this couldn't have been, this can't be the word of God, is not a problem for us. Actually, the history, the actual history, and this is the actual history, is not problematic. And we'll come back here next week as we go kind of more deeply into some of the more key interpretations of Torah, of the Tanakh, and then finally what will be referred to as Midrash. All right, let's close in a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together this evening. We just ask you, Lord, to keep us safe. And those who are of us who are preparing for the Eucharist, we just ask you, Lord, to purify our hearts, to give us eyes to see, ears to hear, where you're calling us to experience your love, but also where we can call to pay it forward and to share it with others. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Let peace Christ, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.